Hello, and welcome to Act In Line, the podcast of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm the producer and also an occasional host, Caroline Roberts. On this episode, I'm happy to first bring you a really interesting conversation with James C. Whitford, who's the executive director of Watered Gardens, an organization dedicated to resolving poverty. And they do this by engaging with the homeless and poor every day, offering services and helping them get back on their feet. Andrew Vanderput, who's Acton's Associate Director of Program Outreach, talks with James about true charity and how it should be kept private, rather than being funneled out of bureaucracies. James gives some real examples of how he's witnessed government creating more problems than solving. Charity and assistance are most effective when it's done by someone who's closest to the poor and knows them as individuals and their individual needs. After that, Dave Hebert, professor of economics at Aquinas College in Grand Rapids, Michigan, joins Acton's Tyler Grunendahl to address a problem that Dave sees as threatening our freedom, and that's America's lack of knowledge of political processes. Only 36% of Americans can name all three branches of government. 35% can't name any branches. And only 60% of Americans can tell you which party runs the House or Senate at any given time. Dave and Tyler discuss how they see this affecting not only our public discourse, but also our overall freedom. If you're interested in any articles or websites mentioned in this episode, or if you're just looking for more information on these topics, don't forget to swing over to Acton's blog to check out the show notes for this episode. I post show notes every Wednesday when our weekly episodes are released, and those are really helpful, giving you more reading material and also links where you can register for our upcoming events. Read our show notes at blog.acton.org. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Vanderput, and I am the Associate Director of Program Outreach here at the Acton Institute. Our guest today is James Whitford. He's the Executive Director of Water Gardens Gospel Mission in Joplin, Missouri. James, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Andrew. Great to be with you today. So there are a ton of topics I'd love to cover during our time together, but what I really want to do is talk about your perspective on charity and how it ought to be completely private as well as you know, what you see as the limits of government to adequately addressing the, the real needs of real people. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to, just for our listeners to hear more about Water Gardens, um, what you do, and why you started it. Uh, sure, right. Well, Water Gardens is uh, kind of a mysterious name for many. We've gotten calls in the past to uh, People wondering if we sell bird baths and lawn equipment, and, <laughs> so, and that's that's not it. It comes out of the Bible in Isaiah chapter fifty-eight, where God is uh, really chastising His people for for not being on the front lines. They're kind of uh, sitting back, going through religious motion, but not really choosing uh, the fast that God wants them to choose, which is to divide their bread with the hungry and to uh, shelter the poor and clothe the naked. And then there are promises associated with that. And one of those promises is that you'll be like a watered garden and like a spring whose waters never fail. So it's a beautiful promise. And when my wife and I started the ministry 18 years ago, uh, we really felt like the name watered gardens was very fitting because of our heart for the church, as much as for those who are struggling in poverty and addiction and a lot of brokenness and uh, wanting to really see the church very active and engaging people who are who are struggling in in need. Now, what that looks like, Andrew, on a day to day basis is we have an outreach center where we'll meet more than twenty thousand basic needs a year. Well, the church does through our through our ministry, and that that involves like more than seven hundred volunteer shifts every month. And uh, we have a long term program for men that are uh, you know struggling with recidivism and uh, having a hard time you know getting up off of the streets or out of chronic uh, poverty or chronic homelessness or chronic addiction and and so there's a very heavy work ready focus in that program and character development and so they go through a year of classes and work readiness and then uh, move on from there uh, we also have uh, a program we call Neighbor Connect. Uh, we connect one neighbor's need to another neighbor's skill. It's one of my favorite things that we do at the ministry. Uh, we have a database of Christians in our community who are willing to help with various service needs out in the community. It could be helping repair a car or mowing a lawn or, or whatever. So that's really a great thing that we do. One of the unique things we do is we have a worth shop. We call it a worth shop because we believe that work awakens worth in people's lives. And so right on the front end, when people are coming into our mission, 
they may uh, see themselves as you know very broken and very much in need, but we have really trained ourselves to look at people uh, a little differently, that they have capacity and potential and ability. And so we capitalize on that by allowing people to enter into our worth shop to earn even the very basics. And that could be things like uh, a meal ticket for the evening or a night of shelter or what have you. And, uh, and so we found some really great things happening uh, just by starting with work on the front end. And we believe that that really drives a, a better outcome of employment in the long run when we start with work on the front end. And so it's kind of a unique approach of our mission. But uh, that's, that's kind of the summary of, of Watered Gardens. Well, I really want to turn our attention to the nature of charity. And I know you have some, uh, some views on charity, what it is, what it isn't. In particular, I know that one of your characteristics um, as you define charity, true charity is that it's private. Can you explain this a little bit more? Well, sure. Um, oh, gosh, I think it was 2012 that we launched our True Charity Initiative, which is a work of watered gardens. It's certainly taking on uh, – it's moving outside of our own community at this point, but we just found ourselves really struggling uh, against bad charity, and that could that could be bad charity at a local level, but it certainly was uh, bad charity at a at a state and federal level. And so uh, we launched this initiative and started to define charity. What is true charity? And we talk about true uh, having the definitions of actualized and accurate and authentic and we won't get into what you know how that all plays out but basically we can sum true charity up as privately funded outcome uh, driven and work oriented so those are the three things that we're really looking at and and believe that you know that that's what uh, qualifies true charity but certainly the privately funded is is a big part and when we talk about this, we say, well, what, you know, what is the hope of charity? Is it not to help people move toward a position in life where they're flourishing? Is it not to help people move to where things ought to be? And so we define justice in that way. It's a very simple definition, but um, the way things ought to be, is that, not, uh, is that not justice in some regard? And how do you get there? Well, uh, charity, if it's effective, can help help us move in that direction, but charity stems from compassion. And that's really where a lot of the privately funded approach and argument comes from is how are you going to have charity that's effective flow from some uh, something that's not compassionate. So compassion means there's somebody interfacing uh, a neighbor in need or it's somebody that might come down to the mission to uh, maybe make a donation or drop off uh, some, and they see somebody and their heart is moved and they want to be charitable because their heart is moved. And so uh, charity has to be privately funded if it's going to be true charity. It's the only way we're really going to see things uh, uh, see people really helped. Indeed. I know you've you've written about this a little bit and you've mentioned constitutionally uh, some arguments that the, the Founding Fathers kind of brought up about charity and whether the federal government should actually allocate resources for charity, as well as the fact that it's really expensive. Can you expand that upon that a little bit more? Well, right. If you look at, I mean, even with this current administration, if you look at the the uh, new fiscal budget for the year, I believe it's um, about $918 billion, nearly a trillion dollars, that is uh, set to be spent on caring for people in need, you know, and, and this doesn't even include, uh, you know, Social Security and Medicare, but caring for the sick, hungry, elderly, and poor. And so we're about to spend a trillion dollars again this year, which has been the pattern. Uh, and this was something that was at one point much more shouldered at the local community level. And, um, and what's really interesting, Andrew, is that that's about how much more in debt we go every year is another trillion dollars. And so I certainly feel compelled to be uh, one voice and one worker among many trying to uh, remind the American public that we've got to uh, shift back to seeing local control and uh, privately funded 
privately funded ministry at work. So let's talk a little bit about government. You know, we just t- you just mentioned the nine hundred eighteen billion dollars, roughly, that the federal government spends on meeting the needs of people in material poverty. You know, why do you think government is uniquely unqualified to truly help people? Well, they don't know people uh, the way that, you know, I know people in my neighborhood the way that you know people in your neighborhood. I'm reminded of uh, a time when I met an elderly woman who was uh, homeless, and she was sitting on the steps of our, our mission smoking a Pall Mall, and I stepped out to just get to know her a little bit, sat down beside her. And she was a chain smoker, so she had a really rough voice, and she had always seemed a bit crass and unapproachable. Uh, but I really wanted to get to know her, and so I just sat down and started a conversation, and before you know it, she was telling me some details about her life, the passing of her husband that had happened in, in April, uh, and then she ended up losing the home that they had lived in. And then she talked about her son and how she went and lived with her son. And there was a fallout in that relationship. And her son actually asked her to leave. And that's why she was, you know, there at the mission. And she starts to weep at that point. And she said um, some really powerful words. She said, I, uh, uh, this my life has never been what I've wanted it to be. And I kind of just scooted over toward her, and I put my arm around her, and she put her head into, into my chest. She's just weeping at this point. She says, uh, these, this forward question was very powerful. She said, how, how did this happen? And that, that question uh, has really stuck with me. How did, that, how did this happen? Because the truth is, she didn't know how all these events in her life culminated to you know, leave her homeless in the position that she was. And really nobody knows exactly how that happens. And I, and I love uh, what Arthur Brooks, he was a former leader of the American Enterprise Institute. I, I think it was in his book, The Conservative Heart, where he talks about the difference between complicated and complex. He says complicated is like building a jet engine. But once you've figured out the engineering and the physics and you have a blueprint for it, it's a complicated problem that's solved. You can build as many jet engines wherever you want uh, forevermore. But complex is different. He describes it more like a football game. And no matter how, you know, the depth of your understanding of football or your predictive analysis tools, you can never predict with the utmost certainty the outcome of a football game because it's simply too complex. Lives, especially people who are struggling in poverty and homelessness and addiction, those lives are far too complex to ever engineer some sort of a blueprint solution that's going to work. And yet that's exactly what bureaucrats in uh, in D.C. do. The, The government fails tremendously at this. You know, one thing that we say that around here is that charity comes from the root word of caritas, which is love. And, you know, the very nat- nature of love is relational. Love is intrinsically relational. So when we in- institutionalize charity through government, you know, I think we essentially hollow out charity and remove its essence because, you know, how can there be true, meaningful relationship between government and, you know, beneficiaries of its social programs? It's just not there. Well, that's right. I mean, government is an institution and uh, there are, you know, policymakers on the end of that, but but uh, there's no individual that's going to interface with another person to understand some of the complex issues of that individual's life to really be able to then empower them uh, and encourage them to uh, rise out of poverty. Well, you know, you've been at this work for 18, 20 years. I'm curious if you could kind of provide some examples of some, uh, you know, unintended consequences of government aid. You know, government is trying to do things to help people. These politicians are trying to do things that help people through government means, but they do have unintended consequences at times. And I would be curious to see in your work um, if you've seen any of those. Oh, yeah. See them regularly. Uh, We certainly don't have enough time to uh, talk about as many as I've uh, seen, but let me share maybe a couple with you. Um, There is a man who... I met, he's, he was a middle-aged, he's a middle-aged man, and he uh, was homeless, uh, addicted, living on the streets, and uh, when I met him, shaking, uh, but wanted to talk with me about our long-term program, Forge. 
and I uh, got to know John and, and uh, found out that, oh, he had um, been abused when he was young and, and actually witnessed a murder uh, before he was 13 years old and had been through a very horrible childhood. And, and you, could, you could understand why he was where he was. And he took us up on this offer of a very challenging program and uh, got, you know, got involved in it and committed himself to it. John has uh, had what, what he called a government package. And those were his words. And specifically, that was a HUD housing voucher, food stamps. Uh, he was uh, on his way to qualifying for early SSI disability. And part of the requirements to enter into our FORGE program is that uh, you, you uh, move toward independence and you have to give up all reliance on the state. And so he did that. And today he's an over-the-road truck driver. He's full-time employed and uh, is a transformed person from the one I met. But something he said that I think is very important for you and I and the listeners today to, to hear, he said that uh, giving up that government package was the hardest decision I have ever had to oh, make wow. in my life. And uh, he even recorded that on a on a PSA spot, and I just thought, oh my gosh, that's because what that means is that there are millions of people who uh, are being drawn in that direction who probably have the capacity and potential of a guy like John, and yet get trapped in um, in, in what the government is offering uh, to people. Very sad. Here's another example. I met a young man, probably about 19 years old, in the dining room of our mission, uh, homeless. And I, I you know, asked him, are you staying in shelter here? And he said, yes. And I said, tell me a little bit about your story. And he said, well, I was staying with my mother and grandmother, uh, but things, you know, weren't too great. And uh, an agency in the community recommended that I leave and, and become homeless so that I would qualify for HUD's rapid rehousing. And so there's a very specific example, and there are many others like that, where uh, govern government's attempt to help actually can create a perverse incentive or inadvertently divide a family. And that was a, that was a very specific situation with, uh, with Seth. And, uh, and I might just share one more, if time allows. There's a, a man that I was mentoring uh, named Rick, and Rick missed one of his appointments. He's a 29-year-old, chronically homeless, chronic, chronic alcoholic, uh, grew up uh, in a home with no father and a, and a mother who was uh, drug addicted, um, and really uh, wanted to help this this man, and so it began to meet with him, and he missed a meeting. And then when he showed up at the next meeting, I said, where were you? You missed your meeting with me. And he, he said, well, I was in jail. And I said, uh, was it public drunkenness, Rick? And he said, yeah. And I, so I had to ask the question, how, how are you even uh, sustaining that habit when you don't have a job? And he said, oh, there are many ways, but this last binge was uh, when I, I just sold my government subsidized cell phone on the street. And so I don't know, Andrew, if you know this, but this, government subsidized cell phones are now uh, have data on them. They're smartphones. They go for about 50 bucks on the street. And uh, so there's an attempt where, you know, a program of the FCC trying to provide communication to rural community through, you know, legislation that's, I think, more than 20 years old is actually being indiscriminately handed out to people who are struggling in poverty uh, and, and folks then have that asset to liquidate to sustain a habit that's not helping them. And so, again, government doesn't know Rick. I do. And that's the problem. Well, I know, you know, another idea or concept that we talk about at Acton, and I know that you've grabbed a hold of it as well as the idea of subsidiarity and the idea that those essentially closest to the problem are the ones that should address address it and have the ability and know how to do it best. And it's only when they can't that it should be kicked up to a higher level of authority. And so would you just kind of say that when government does this, it really crowds out, you know, the whether it's the family or the local organization such as yourself, when government engages in these actions, it crowds you guys out. Oh, yeah. It is a breach of subsidiarity. Uh, and in fact, it is uh, really 
the primary reason, I don't even know if I knew the word in 2012, but seeing that breach of subsidiarity at work was uh, the primary reason we launched our True Charity Initiative and realizing that we have got to find ways to be, again, a part of what I think is a growing movement now, thanks to Acton and many other groups and Poverty Cure, to see neighbor helping neighbor before the state helps your neighbor. But as long as the state uh, provides you know, low-hanging fruit of simple means-tested welfare and that type of thing, it's, it's going to be a great interference to what would, I think, otherwise be very effective uh, work in people's lives. One question that uh, critics would have, and I think it's a good question uh, about this pro- approach of charity being predominantly, if not completely, privately funded, is you know the fact of the matter is that the needs out there within our country are, are massive, and private charity can't possibly meet all of those needs. What would you say to that criticism? I would want to talk about crowd out effect, and so I've I've read a number of research uh, pieces on on crowd out that the more the government's involved, uh, the more the private sector is crowded out of that uh, particular um, you know social sector. And I, I, after you know, reading, I believe it's true. I believe that's happening. In fact, I, I, I've even seen examples of it. Let me give you a quick example. Missouri, the state in which I live, has made some cuts in prisoner reentry funding. So these are folks coming out of prison and need to get into the workforce. And so there were some funds that were helping them be outfitted to go to work as they came out of incarceration, and they made those cuts. And uh, <clears throat> Much of our community was up in arms about it, and I said, I, I think, you know, l- let the cuts happen, and let's see what happens. And sure enough, a church uh, stepped up to provide uh, some of the things that were required for folks to, uh, to get back into the workforce because of those cuts. Now, the, the thing we've got to, you know, realize is that church had no idea that they were crowded out of something uh, beforehand. And so that's the interesting thing about being crowded out. It's out of sight and therefore often out of mind. And I don't think we have any idea uh, the amount of crowd out that's happened. I, I really believe that local community response can be, uh, would be much, much more than we could possibly imagine. And in fact, Living in a city where, you know, in 2011, an F5 tornado a mile wide came right through the center of our city and, and rendered 7,000 people homeless immediately, uh, you know, within an hour. I watched uh, incredible, compassionate, neighborly relief and community response that could have never been done uh, by the government. Why? Because people saw people in need, and compassion was awakened, and charity flowed. Uh, And that is uh, what I believe would happen if we really began to uh, withdraw these government programs. I think we'd see local community and neighbors step up. Well, I think we'll leave it there for now, but I really encourage our listeners to Google um, Water Gardens Gospel Rescue Mission, uh, True Charity University, and even Neighbor Connect. Um, that message or that program that James mentioned earlier, which is so neat that connects neighbors to neighbors and skills to needs. Um, so James, thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate it. No, thanks for the time. I've really enjoyed it. Acting University is not your typical conference. It's a four day celebration with 1000 of your newest Liberty loving friends from all over the world. Each day is packed with thought-provoking presentations on the foundations of a free society. Expand your worldview and explore theology, business, market-based economics, and much more at the most unique conference in the Liberty Movement. To apply, visit university.acton.org. Hello, my name is Tyler Grunendahl. I'm the Foundation Relations Coordinator here at the Acton Institute, and I'm here with Dave Hebert, Professor of Economics at Aquinas College. Hey, Tyler. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for coming. So what did you want to discuss today? Yeah, so something that I've been kind of thinking a lot about is why is it the case that 
congressional approval ratings are always so low. So if you look at some recent Gallup poll data, what you find is that the congressional approval rating is rarely above 40 percent, and really it hovers closer to 20 percent, especially over the last decade or two. And I mean, there was a spike of 80 percent that was in October of 2001, uh, so we can understand that one. <laughs> um, and so what I'm trying to kind of discuss is is why is it that we're so unhappy with what's coming out of Congress. And I think there's a great insight from Thomas Jefferson. Well, Thomas Jefferson, uh, while while he was helping to write the Constitution way, way back in the day, uh, he said that an educated citizenry is a vital requisite for our survival as a free people. And I think that today, if we look at what's going on in our country, I think we've failed to hold up our end of the bargain. Us as a citizenry or we as a citizenry Just we're not that educated. And so the claim that I'm going to try to make is that people today, we care far too much about politics in that we let it completely ruin our day. But we also care far too little in that we know almost nothing. So one thing that we can think about is think about like, let's say you're at a party where you don't know everyone there and you're just kind of mingling and making small talk. And Mm -hmm. someone comes out and says, well, you know, that's why I voted for Hillary, right? Based on that, you instantly know so much or you feel like you know so much about that person. Mm -hmm. And we know from, you know, kindergarten onward that stereotyping people or judging a book by its cover is wrong. We know not to do that. And yet with politics, we're like, okay with it. Now, let's think about like how much what comes out of D.C. like really affects our everyday lives. Some things have obvious effects. So gay marriage, immigration policy, those have big effects. Tax policy, Tax spending, spending policy, like that. Spending pol- like there are some things that come out of D.C. that are big and important, and there's no denying that one, okay? But there's a lot of stuff that comes out of there that really is inconsequential that we get so worked up about. So if I told you that Donald Trump played golf today, which I don't know if he did, but let's say he did. Cool. I struggle to see how that affects my life in any meaningful way. Right. I mean, imagine, but here's the thing. If you say that to a conservative crowd, Mm -hmm. they're going to respond with like, well, yeah, he's the leader of the free world. Of course he needs a day off to like recharge his executive batteries. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you say that to a less conservative crowd or an anti-Trump crowd, you know, they're going to fly off the handle and say like, oh, this is evidence that he's just the worst human being ever. Right. And it's like, OK. And that same thing was going on for every president in my lifetime, at least right. any time, just switching sides, depending yeah. on who's in office. Yeah. I remember when, you know, President Obama played golf and the conservatives were outraged. I mean, it's the <laughs> same story. Yeah. Right. But let's just back up and think like, OK, well, what would happen if let's say the president takes six hours to play golf? Plus, let's assume six hours of travel time because, you know, why not? Twelve hours. What if he worked 12 hours? How would your life be different today? My guess is not at all. And yet we're going to get so worked up over this. But on the flip side, we care too little. So we care too little to investigate how policy is actually made Mm -hmm. uh, relative to how big of a role policy plays in our economy, especially compared to like other things where our like participation has little discernible effect. So, Tyler, I happen to know you're not you know, a huge sports fan. Not particularly, no. And that's not a, you know, I'm not making fun of you or anything. That's just a (laughs) statement. Do you know who won the Super Bowl this year? I believe it was the New England Patriots. Yeah, right. Who was their quarterback? Tom Brady. Yep. Who's, um, can you name two professional sports teams in Michigan? The Detroit Red Wings and the Detroit Pistons. Great. Could you name one more? Uh, The Tigers. Yeah, right. The Detroit Tigers, which who play? What's their sport? Uh, Baseball, I think. Yeah, right. Perfect. Okay, so you are like the modal American, right? You know a lot about sports, even though you don't really, it seems at least, care too much about it. That is accurate, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Do you know how much economic activity is generated by sports, all professional sports combined? I'm going to guess $100 billion. Uh, Close. 70 Okay. So $70 billion of economic activity comes out of sports. Do you have any idea how much economic activity comes out of Washington, D.C.? What are we defining as economic activity? Uh, any government spending. Oh, trillions. Yeah, $3.6 trillion per year. Okay. Now, if in America, we all know lots and lots about sports, 
and that's fine. I'm not trying to say we should not pay attention to sports. They're mm-hmm. fun. But in terms of like our impact on our lives, very small, but we know a lot, right? In terms of politics, though, the impact on our lives in terms of like spending and GDP and economic activity, huge, Mm -hmm. but our knowledge is very small. So I'm just going to give you some quick facts about some stuff. Uh, Only 36% of Americans can actually name all three branches of government. That is staggering to me. Yeah, that's awful, right? 35% actually can't name any. Oh, my word. Not even one, right? 60% of Americans don't know which party controls the Senate or the House at any given time. Mm-hmm. I mean, they might know now, given that the House flipped to Democrat control recently. Yeah. But I bet you six months from now they won't know. They'll have forgotten. Yep. Uh, let's see. Two, or 27% know that it takes a two-thirds vote in both chambers of Congress to override a presidential veto. A staggering number of people think that Merrick Garland, who... Uh, as you may recall, was President Obama's Supreme Court nominee that was never considered Uh by the Senate. Uh, A staggering number of people think that Merrick Garland actually had some sort of veto power in the Brett Kavanaugh consideration and and nomination process. Like they thought, like, we got to call, you know, Merrick, get him in here to like solve this problem. And like, he has no voice. Like, that's not something he can do. And even more alarming, and this is uh, something that I've observed in my own life, is that people tend to think that when we see sort of an impassioned speech on the floor of the House or the Senate by someone, you know, a member of Congress, Mm -hmm. they tend to think that that room is full of other people. It's empty. (laughs) There's like the president pro tempore of the Senate or the Speaker of the House, like they'll be in there. Mm -hmm. The stenographer who's recording, you know, all the words that are said. The cameraman. The cameraman, right? The member of Congress who's talking. And usually one or two staff members from that person's office. And that's it. Now, on the balcony, there's tours that are going by. And like you can't take pictures in there because you have to drop your phone and your camera off. Mm-hmm. And they tell you, you know, you have to be quiet because this is all going on national television. But that's it. That's all <laughs> the people. There's not, like, conversation going on, uh, you know, across the aisle on the floor of Congress. Yeah. It's literally a chamber where people get up on TV, make an impassioned speech, And then some votes happen every now and then. There's no real discussion. And so one thing that was, you know, been really interesting is actually Paul Ryan's tenure as Speaker of the House. So he brought almost every bill before the House as a closed bill. That's something that's never been done. Or at least the ratio or the percentage of bills that he brought to the floor as closed is higher than any other speaker. Wow. Yeah. I mean, this is a wild thing. And it's part of the reason is, is we don't understand sort of this legislative process. We don't understand what's going on. And granted, it's very cumbersome. Mm-hmm. I mean, the rules of the Senate are hundreds and hundreds of pages long. But coming back to the Jefferson quote, you know, we need to have an educated citizenry if this is something that we value, if freedom is something that we want. And we haven't lived up to it. We have failed to keep our our knowledge or our understanding of Congress and how it works in line with sort of the importance or the magnitude of what it's doing. Consequently, it's no surprise that they're doing things that we don't like. And that's reflected in our approval rating. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that the ignorance that we have, we as in like the general citizenry Mm -hmm. have about the process or the houses of Congress or anything. Mm Mm-hmm directly translates into why we're so unsatisfied with it? Yeah, I think if more people understood how this process worked, I think we could call the, call our, our Congress people and voice our concerns on this. Mm-hmm. I think there's a really direct sort of correlation between how little we know and how free we are as a people. I think that's absolutely correct. Yeah. So do you think there's a reason why people tend not to know so much, given that it's so important why is it that we don't tend to value how important it is in the, what we care about and what we learn and all that? Yeah. So the big problem is it comes from uh, Brian Kaplan and his he kind of gives the best example of it in his book, The Myth of the Rational Voter. That's a great book. It's a fantastic book. And I think it's an important book that more people should read. Um, and so his argument is fairly simple. And the idea is that in a population of like 300 million or 165 some odd million uh, people who could vote, the probability that my one vote 
will make a difference in the outcome of an election is basically zero. Mm -hmm. So what's sort of the the benefit of, of casting an informed vote is obvious, right? If everyone you know sat down and took the time to read bills, consider them, um, I would like them to look at the economics of the bill. But of course. obviously, I'm an economics professor, and there are <laughs> far more perspectives than just economics to bear on any topic. Yeah. Uh, but you know that would be to me a great place to start. If everyone did that, then I think the decisions that we make as a democracy would be better. The problem is. You know, if I let's say I don't, let's say everyone else in the country does and I don't, the result is going to be the same. So we have this thing called like an informed vote that is highly beneficial to everyone else in the country and highly costly, but only to me. Mm -hmm. Right. I have to incur all the cost of acquiring all that information, of thinking about it all the time and, and weighing the pros and cons of any decision. I have to incur that cost. And I don't feel the full benefit of it because my one vote is very unlikely to make a difference. So Brian calls this uh, rational irrationality, mm -hmm. where basically the cost of information outweighs the benefit of information to me. And that's a big problem, and we have to overcome that problem. So I think Brian is exactly right in saying that it's rational for us to not know these things, given that our one vote isn't going to make that big of a difference. But I don't think he's right in sort of the moral aspect or the higher calling aspect. I think that we as a citizenry do have sort of this moral, uh, moral responsibility to actually investigate these things and know them and understand them. Because it's what we do as a democracy is bigger than any one of us. And I think that's a, an important insight that we've lost. Sure. Do you think that if the practical sort of utilitarian perspective on why we should be involved in politics or at least understand it may be lost on people, maybe this moral argument could be more persuasive? It's more of a duty. It's more of something that you should do as a citizen rather than just the direct economic benefit to yourself by casting an informed vote. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly I think that's exactly it. You know, it's it's perfectly rational for us to basically free ride off of the knowledge or or benefits of everyone else's informed more informed decision like mm -hmm. that makes perfect sense but a lot of things in the world would make perfect sense but we don't do them so <laughs> i hold i will hold a door open far too long uh, by from my perspective if it means that someone you know a few steps behind me can get in the building quicker right that's a polite thing to do mm -hmm. I don't find it to be like economically rational because I don't really derive too many benefits from holding that door open. And in fact, I incur the cost of standing outside in the snow or the rain or the cold for longer. Mm -hmm. But I still do it because I know it's the right thing to do. Yeah, it's the same kind of and it's the same thing, I think, with democracy and voting. We have a moral responsibility to know more about what it is that we're voting on. And I don't think we're living up to that that responsibility at all. Uh, your quote on Thomas Jefferson, well, the Thomas Jefferson quote reminded me of a similar one by George Washington in his farewell address. He says, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. And that's sort of the fusion that we try to talk about here at Acton is the role that religion and morality have in addition to the role of education in sustaining freedom in a flourishing society. I think the founders had it pretty wise when they talked about those things all being necessary. And I think we've kind of lost a lot of that, as you've outlined here today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've lost, I think, so much in the, several, the couple hundred years since our founding. We've lost a lot, and we need to find a way to get it back. And if we don't, we're just going to continue marching on this line towards unfreedom and away from the freedom that we all so desperately want. Well, let's hope we made some positive steps here today. Let's hope so. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming. Thank you for listening today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We're always trying to make a great show for you. And one of the ways in which we can do that is to use feedback from you. We would love to hear from you. Whether you'd like to suggest a specific guest or topic, let us know what you like or dislike in our shows, or just generally let us know why you like listening. You can shoot us an email at actinline at actin.org. 
In addition to that, we're trying to create a new occasional segment for the show. If you have any questions related to a subject we've covered on this podcast before, or questions related to economics, faith, business, or maybe a current issue you'd like to hear discussed on the podcast, leave us a message at 888-705-4180. If your question is picked, you'll get to hear it on the show, and members of our team here at the Acton Institute will break it down on the podcast. Last but definitely not least, if you like Acton Line, please subscribe today. And don't forget to share it with your friends or family members who might also enjoy listening to this podcast. We're available on Google Play, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. This episode is produced by me, Caroline Roberts, with audio mixing by Doug Nagel.